<laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Shepherd Gate. It's our joy to be with you this morning, entering to a time of praise and worship. If you all would stand and join with us, we're so glad to be with you. We're going to praise the Lord. This is a place of freedom in our worship, and I just want to encourage you to enter in. And for those of you who are coming through the stream, we welcome you as well. We're so glad to be with you this morning. In Jesus' name. our days for the one that once was buried lives again now the tomb is bare and empty and the stone is rolled away praise the risen one who overcame the grave all you broken hearted all you worn and weak Find living waters, everlasting springs. To the wandering spirit, lost and searching, wanting something more. Find the risen King who overcomes the world. Let there be dancing in the darkness, and let our songs break through the night. Let your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. No more condemnation, no more doubt and fear. For our sin and shame, they have no power here. His resurrection, perfect love has set the captives free. Praise the risen King who stands in victory. Let there be dancing in the darkness, and let our songs bring through the night. Let your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. Let there be dancing in Undone, hallelujah. Jesus has won, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus, hallelujah. Death is undone, hallelujah. Jesus has won, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus, hallelujah. Woo. Praise God. Praise God. It's our what a joy it is to be with you this morning to praise the Lord together. I just want to encourage you. This is a time for the church to gather and to praise his holy name. Let's come before him. 
We have a new song this morning, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. I'm going to read Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise the Lord. What gift of grace, what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless grace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine. I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Sing, the night is dark, the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoice. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me sing no fate I dread no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my heart and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea chains are released I can see I am free yet not I but through Christ in me Thank you, God. with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore to is 
is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me
television. There's so many different things that can distract and pull us out of what is real and what is true. Father, we pray for your vision this morning. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and in our lives. That we would see clearly, Father, as you desire us to see. Father, do a work in us this morning. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, for your vision, for both us individually, for our families, for our church, for Lord God. We desire your vision. Father, bring that this morning. We love you, God. We worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. You all may be seated. Praise God. We want to welcome you to our family service. Uh, what that means is we're going to be hanging out together. We are still going to have our senior high Sunday school, but just want to welcome you here. We're going to continue in this heart of worship as we come before the Lord through a time of communion. So I'm going to pray a blessing over our elements. We do invite you uh, to partake of that. If you are a believer in Jesus, we want to invite you to take of communion. If you haven't been able to prepare your communion, we have communion out in the lobby. For those of you who are here, for those of you who are at home, we encourage you to prepare your communion. We're going to take that together. But I am going to ask for God's blessing over this time. Uh, I was re recently reminded, often we speak about our relationships with others during this time, which is important. But one of the most important thing is our relationship with God, that we get to meet with him in this time of communion. So I want to encourage you, prepare your heart to meet with Jesus. <laughs> he wants to meet with you during this time. And uh, I'm just so glad we get to do that together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for these elements, for your body and blood, which was shed for us, Lord God. We remember that. During this time of communion, we also remember your resurrection, Father. We remember that you have conquered sin and death. You've conquered it in our hearts. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us through this time. Lord, if there is any hardness in our heart towards you, Father, I pray that you would break through that, God. I pray that this would be a time of humility and of reconnecting with you. Continuing in worship with you, Father, we thank you, God. Lord, we give you this time. It is, is our joy to meet with you, to commune with you. Prepare our hearts. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Thank you, Father. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. In Jesus' name. Let's take and drink. Father, we thank you that with the breath that you've given us, we have the opportunity to praise you. Father, I thank you that you bring renewal 
and we're refreshing in your presence. Lord, you also bring a call to righteousness in your presence. And I pray, God, that we would answer that call this morning, that we would be drawn to you, Lord God. I thank you that our worship is, is not just one aspect. It's not just singing. It's not just reading your word. It's, it's our very being, Lord God, coming before you and saying, God, here's all of me. So I pray, God, that we would respond to your love this morning. Lord, I thank you that you meet us where we are. Whatever is going on in our heart, whatever is going on in our life, Father, you are there. And you're calling us to yourself. So call us to yourself this morning. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. We uh, have made it a practice here at Shepherdgate Church to thank the Lord uh, through our tithes and offerings and to just pray a blessing over them. Uh, it is a joy to partake of God's kingdom. And God has given us opportunities here at Shepherdgate. So I encourage you to go before the Lord. This is a time between you and God. It is an act of worship. When God calls us to entrust to him our resources, um, you know, where, where is God leading you to give? Where is God leading you to invest in his kingdom? And I just want to encourage you, uh, go before the Lord. There is no compulsion in this. It is purely, God, what would you have me do? And I just want to encourage you to do that and to go before the Lord. And we're going to thank him for those tithes and offerings. And that they're going to go out and increase his kingdom and bless others. So let's please join with me. Father, we thank you for these tithes and offerings. We thank you for the opportunity to give here at Shepherdgate Church. Lord God, to give to the missionaries that you've called us to partner with, to give towards the ministry here at Shepherdgate. Father, we just thank you so much for every aspect uh, that you have blessed us with, Lord God, to invest in your kingdom. So, Father, we lift these tithes and offerings to you, God. We pray that they would bring you glory, that they would bring a blessing, Father, uh, not only to those who are given the, the, the resources, Lord God, but for us who are giving, God, that we would experience the blessing of trust, entrusting in you, Father, experience the blessing of investing in your kingdom, Lord God. I thank you for all that you are doing through these resources, through these finances, Lord God, and we give you the glory. We take none, of, none for ourselves, Lord God, but we give it to you, God, and we thank you for what you're going to do both in us as we give and, and through the, these finances that you've called us to invest in your kingdom. So we give you the glory. We thank you. We praise you. And it's all yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. One thing I didn't mention, there are multiple ways to give here. If you want to give online, we also have an in-person box for those who are a little bit more um, tactile <laughs> in, in that. I know I am. I was, I'm the guy in the meeting where everybody's typing on a computer. I'm writing down on a notepad. That's just the way uh, that I still like to do it. So I encourage you. Uh, there are multiple ways to do that. We have a couple of announcements this morning I'm going to go through. So this is kind of a, a shift <laughs> here as we go into this time. Uh, the first announcement is that uh, we are going to have a yard sale. Oh, sorry. The first announcement is that we have our senior high Sunday school, like I mentioned. Uh, we, that goes from grade 9 to 12. And that's led by Nick Brigman. I encourage you, if you are within that age range, uh, please partake of that. We're going to release you guys to the library. Like I said, it is a family service, so we're going to try to keep things going for the kids. Um, but just wanted to invite the teens to that Sunday school. We also have our youth group yard sale coming up. It's our annual <laughs> uh, blessing <laughs> to the church. Uh, we just want to encourage you. We are going to begin collecting for that yard sale after church this Sunday. If you have a donation that you would like to give, please drop it off in the youth room, which is this room over here. For those of you who are at home, you're just going to have to ask when you get here. Uh, we, we're going to collect those items for the next uh, little over a week and a half and uh, encourage you to 
go through your stuff and whatever you feel you'd love to get rid of, <laughs> we'll take it. We do ask a couple of caveats. Uh, anything with stuffing is really difficult to sell or get rid of afterward. Um, so I please, uh, as much as you may love that couch <laughs> and think that somebody would love it, um, if, it's, if it has that stuffing, it's really hard to get rid of. So, uh, and I know this goes without saying, but used undergarments, nobody needs those. So you just throw those away. That's okay. That's okay to throw those away if you don't want to keep those. Uh, but we're going to collect the items. We're going to have a pricing party uh, Friday night before the yard sale. You know, typically that's a youth group event with parents invited as well. If you just want to serve and you want to get plugged in and help out, I would love your help because I can price many things, but there's a lot of things I have no clue uh, how to price them. And I would love help with sorting. And it's uh, eventually after we've collected all the items, all the items will be in the sanctuary and we'll sort them all out. So I encourage you, if you're looking for a place to serve, that's one area where we'd love your help, as well as on that Saturday, getting all the items outside so that we can sell them. But this is a fundraiser for our, our camp. It helps us to keep the cost of camp down. It also helps to pay for our guest speaker. Uh, I'll be giving more information about camp uh, in the next couple weeks, so you guys can uh, be praying about coming to that camp and uh, just so excited about that. And last but not least, our Vacation Bible School is coming up very quickly. We have Rocky Railway is, is kind of the theme. I want you to save the date. It's going to be June, I'm sorry, I cannot, June 26th through the 30th. And that's a 9 to noon, 9 a.m. to noon. Uh, if you are looking for another place to serve, uh, please see Ms. Carmen, uh, who is planning that event. If you'd like to plug in and help out with that. It takes uh, an army. <laughs> uh, we typically have anywhere from 40 to 60 kids that come to VBS. And it's just such a wonderful outreach and blessing to get to, to interact with the community in this way. So I encourage you, if God is leading you to, to help out in that way, please see Ms. Carmen. If you'd like to send your kids, uh, you know, we have registration opening up. And we'd love to, love to get your kids involved there. So praise the Lord. With that, I'm going to release our high school students for their Sunday school, and I'm going to invite Pastor Dan Dewis up to share God's word. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. I get the challenge of keeping everybody's attention. I ask kids, do you know why we encourage you not to make noise during church? Yes, because some people are sleeping. Well, hopefully nobody's be sleeping today. Praise the Lord. And it's a, I've got a wide age span here. I kind of thought the target would be the senior high, but they, they're gone. Andrew did this to me. He set me up for, so I'm going to try and keep you kids engaged as well as the adults, which is a pretty good challenge. I thought I'd start this, this uh, today's message because we're coming into Mother's Day and then Father's Day and thinking about what it is for parenting with children. And so uh, going to try and steer us in that direction. First of all, kids, I'm going to ask you a question. Are any kids still here? <laughs> Oliver, you were just leaving when I was going to ask you a question. I knew you'd like it. So growing up, we often did fun things with our parents. What are the things you'd like to do with your parents? Do you have a special thing you like to do? Anybody? I, miss, I missed it. I, can't, I couldn't understand you guys. Play with you, okay. What else? Anything specific you like to do with your parents? You like them to take you to the movies or play video games? Who knows? Well, I got you talking anyway, but now let's see if we can get your attention back. When we were young, in my generation, the thing that we really kind of did with our dads was we play catch. 
You know what that means? Today it might be different. Today you might kick a soccer ball back and forth, but in, in our day it was baseball. And we, that was what we all kind of grew up with was baseball. And so I remember being about seven or eight years old, and my dad had gone to the Army Surplus. And for 50 cents, we've got inflation now, it'd probably be $50, but for 50 cents, he could buy a baseball mitt. And so he got me a baseball mitt, and he got himself a catcher's mitt. And he had lots of padding on his mitt, and I had almost none on mine. And so, you know, when you're seven, eight years old, you just throw the ball back and forth, right? But you don't understand, my dad was German, 13th of 14 kids, and there was nothing really safe about him. When he was four years old, his older brothers and sisters took him and tied him upside down, hung him by his feet in the corn crib, and waved a snake in his face until he stopped crying. That would make you cry, right? This, they were, to say they were um, a little bit sadistic would be an understatement. So that's the way my dad grew up, and he thought... The uh, Three Stooges was great comedy, and any time you'd fall down or you'd get hurt, he'd just laugh and laugh and laugh. He thought that was so funny. That I, I remember him. We just moved out to the farm. I, he was, I was seven years old, and we had a, a. He bought a horse. She was scary, and she was very fast. She was part quarter horse, part Arabian, and she was walking around with us as we were working on the fence. And and I said, Dad, I. Just put me up on her. She's just walking around with us. Just put me up on her. So he puts me up on this mare. And I thought, well, this is going to be fun. She's just going to walk around and we're going to work on the fence together. Until he goes, yeah, and slaps her on the butt. She takes off right through the middle of the field. She's flying as fast as she can go. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Here's my mind, my little seven-year-old mind. There's barbed wire at the bottom of this field, all three strands of barbed wire. What is she going to do? Is she going to stop and throw me in the barbed wire? Is she going to run through? What's going to happen? Well, I didn't have to think that far ahead because she got about halfway through and something scared her. And she turned sideways. It was like a barrel racer, you know. She just turns sideways. And she almost lays down when she does that. And I just keep on going straight. And I hit the ground, tumble, tumble, tumble. Three times I rolled over. I was so mad, I came back up. I said, what'd you do that for, Dad? And all he did was laugh. He thought it was the funniest thing. He, he could easily break your neck, you know. We don't, he didn't think about danger at all. There was no such thing as getting hurt or dangerous. That was kind of the way we grew up. So for us, playing catch wasn't... It was throwing it as hard as you could at each other. And he's a grown man. I'm seven years old. And every day I would come in, my hand would just be totally red. Just, he was throwing so hard, and I thought, I don't know why he's doing that, but I, I, day after day I'd go out and play again. So, burn my hand, and I, he'd have a catcher's mitt. It never hurt him. Burn my hand, didn't hurt him. Well, one day I was playing third base on a baseball field. I was about 11 years old, and a guy hits the ball and he drives a line drive right at my head. And my coach was a, actually a scout for the professional teams. And um, it just happened to be my coach. And all of a sudden, my, I'm th playing third base, ball coming straight at me. Just like that. Even he was impressed. How'd you have such quick reactions? Well, it was just like my dad throwing a ball at my head. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe that was a good thing. Dad taught me how to react. So we, we do things with our kids, but... As that little illustration goes on, we decided we would go back in the summer times, we'd go back to our home in Nebraska, and I was about 11 years old now, 11, maybe going on 12. And so we went back, and we stopped in Iowa, which is before Nebraska, if you don't know your geography, but you go through Iowa before you get to Nebraska, and there was a doctor's family there that used to be our family doctor. In those days, when you're... In the 50s, the doctor would come to your house. And this doctor actually came to my house. You know why he came to the house? Because I'm five years old and I'm playing in the 
with the car in the driveway and nobody put the emergency brake on and there was a shifter was on the hand a column. I don't know many of you would know that, but you have a clutch and a shift here. And I happened to move it into neutral and the car started rolling backwards. Well, I did what all I see all the older guys do when they get cars, they need to push it. I ran back behind the car and was trying to push it and hold it. And it just knocked me down, rolled right over me. Ran over both legs. I was wearing shorts and the neighbor across the road, she's a, uh, across the street, she was a nurse. She comes running over and kind of panicking. They lift me up and carry me into the couch and they call the doctor and Dr. Bailey comes over and he said, uh, he looked at me, he says, Danny, he used to call me Danny, he said, Danny, do you think you can stand up? So I stood up, he said, do you think you can walk? And so I walked, he says, I think you're fine, you can go out and play. Okay, bye. <laughs> so we stopped at Dr. Bailey's house. And after a long drive from Nebraska to Iowa, what did we do? We went out to play a game of catch. My dad and I are... We don't call it catch. We call it burnout because we're just blazing the ball as hard as we can at each other. And everybody's watching and going, my, what? Trying to kill each other? What are they doing? And on this occasion, my dad with his catcher's mitt tried to catch the ball and he got his thumb in the way and he split his thumb wide open and blood was going everywhere. Well, we happened to be staying at a doctor's house. The doctor just stitched him up. Everything was fine. But that was the last day we played catch or we played burnout. Never again did we play. And so then what are you going to have in common with your dad? Well, didn't have much in common. He'd come to my football games and sometime I was 7th grade through 12th, he'd come watch the games. Didn't ever have much to say about him. He was mostly critical when he said anything. In other words, I grew up with a father that if you did it this way, you should have done it that way. And if I did it this way, well, then you should have done it that way. I don't know why he was always on the opposite side, but he was political before his time. Because nowadays, if one party decides to take one side, the other party takes the other side without consistency of principle. Just crazy. That was the way it was. He, he was very critical. And, and so we didn't, we, as time went on, we grew, we didn't talk much. We didn't really have much to say to each other. In fact, we were kind of hostile to each other. My grandmother would listen and she would say, I don't know why he's so hard on you. And I said, I don't know either. But I, I found out later, I think I know why he was. But that was a, a very difficult time as a teenager and not really having a great relationship with your father. And my father was, uh, and my mother would fight all the time. We would laugh, my sisters and I would laugh at him because my dad called my mother you old heifer, or he called her battle axe. You battle axe. And she called him an old goat, and we would sit there and we'd just kind of laugh at him. But they'd get really loud and shouting at each other, and it was not a very pleasant place to be. So I went on all the way through high school, then I left for college, and, and uh, so, you know, I'm working my way in the summers. I'm not home much because I have to work as much as I can to pay for my college. And so we don't have much time and we don't have anything in common. We really don't have a relationship. And that's the way it went on all the way through college. You come home, and I just work at 60, 80 hours a week, play soccer at night. Didn't really have much relationship. We didn't have any place where we intersected in life. It was pretty pretty barren. So finally I grow up enough, I graduate from college and when I graduate from college I come home and I've been offered a good job, I'm working long hours. The church, crazy as they were, said we'd like you to work with our youth. And I says, well I, I hardly believe myself anymore. And they say, well that doesn't matter, just we want you to work with you. Also, we would like you to be a deacon in the church. And I'm like, I just graduated from college. Yeah, well, you, you'll do. Thinking, you guys have very low standards. So I'm doing all this stuff and still very little relationship. But it, shortly after that time is where I came to have a meaningful relationship with Jesus. Asked Jesus into my life. And when Jesus came in, he changed my heart. So... Now, when my father would say something degrading to me, 
Instead of responding in kind, I just try to love him back and not try to react negatively, just love him back. So my whole purpose was just I want my dad to understand the love that I have received from Jesus. I want him to receive it the same way. When all that happens, the Lord started to reveal to me about my father. I didn't know much. You know, how much do you really know about your parents? You maybe want to ask them a lot of questions because right now I would like to have information that I didn't write down. I wasn't paying attention when my parents were telling me things. My mom was telling me about how she was raised and how they used to, you know, make things in the old days, their own soap and candles and all that stuff. And I just wasn't listening. And I didn't write it down. So some of that I don't remember. I wish I did. So it'd be good to ask your parents, well, I didn't really know much about my dad. I knew that he was 13th of 14 kids, that there were seven boys and seven girls, and that was about it. But I didn't realize that my father's father died when he was 11. That meant he was, his mother was older. She didn't want to take care of him anymore. She had grandchildren older than my father. She was worn out. And so dad said, tells me this later, he said, I got passed around to the older sisters. I was like a foster child in my own family. Well, in those days, you get an eighth grade education, you went to work on the farm, and there was no farm work for my dad. We're in the, all the older brothers and sisters had acquired the farms, they were doing all the work, and so he'd finished eighth grade at 12 years old, and he thought, well, I'll, I'll go to high school. To ride to high school, he had to get a pony, and he rode four miles each way to go to, to school and get his education. He graduates at 16. There's still nothing for him to do. We're talking about the Dust Bowl in the 30s. If you know anything about the Depression in the dirty 30s, they called it. And Dad was trying to get a start in life, and he was all on his own. So he applied at the University of Nebraska to be a dairy major, you know, a farmer milking cows. And that's what he did for 15 cents an hour, round the clock, they would be milking cows, and that's how he paid his way through college. Trucks would come in the middle of the night, he'd have to unload them, you get 15 cents an hour, unload the hay, unload the grain, feed the cattle. This is what he did. So he worked his way through college, graduates at the age of 20, and starts teaching. And that's when he met my mother, and they get, we don't really understand what the depression was like. But my mom and dad were both teachers, and when they got married, you were only allowed one salary per family because double dipping would be unfair. And so mom had to quit her job. And he says, well, if you're going to be home, you might as well have a baby. So the next year they had a baby. He's just doing his vocational education around the area. And next thing you know, he's, uh, they're pregnant again. And World War II breaks out, and since part of his deal in college was ROTC, away to college he goes. I mean, away to war he goes, to World War II. And they said when he came back from the war, he was never the same. And I've told you a little bit about what happened with him and some of the battles that he was in. But he was, he was terribly scarred and just was a different person when he came back. And so a lot of this hardness and quietness and stuff, I started to realize what he had gone through. And it changed my attitude toward him. And I tried to bridge then a relationship with my dad. It was so important to me to build a relationship with him. And God just put it on my heart. When, and as, as time went on, I'm reading the scriptures and the very last two verses of the Old Testament before we have a 400 years, 432 years really, before Jesus comes, this is a period just like 400 years in the wilderness and, or 400 years in slavery and 40 years in the wilderness. There was a, a reason why they say it was 400 years. It was completion. And they completed a process and then it was, this is what uh, Malachi records. He says in verse 5, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. 
And when I read that, I realized that my heart was supposed to be turned to God. I, God calls us to repent, to repent of a lot of things. And one of the things was I need to repent for a bad attitude toward my father. When he, we, people read this and they, they say, well, before Jesus comes, Elijah's got to come. And, and Jesus indicates that this would be John the Baptist who came in very similar ways as John the Baptist, the way the, the clothes they wore, the, the authorities who were adverse to their messages, the call to repentance, the, uh, so many things that w kind of lined those two figures together. And, and then Jesus says later, he says, if you can receive it, John the Baptist is coming in the spirit of Elijah and would be the forerunner for Christ. Well, we, we looked through, and uh, I was then asked, I, I was at one church is working with the youth, and another church asked me to come as a youth pastor. And this was the very verses that for the decade of the 70s was kind of my ministry verse. I came in, and they wanted me to work with their children, with their youth, and I said, my goal here is to unite parents with their teenagers. And that was a little bit different because people were thinking the idea of a youth pastor is to come and be their buddy. <laughs> I didn't come to be their buddy. I came to unite the hearts of the fathers and the mothers to their children, their children's hearts to them. And that's what we'd, we'd do things. We'd have projects and whatnot. And we'd have seminars to try to bring these people together, bring these families together. And so it became a, a pretty uh, strategic and defined ministry for me. In fact, I had uh, the former pastor of that church came to me and he said, I want to thank you because at that time when you came, my son and I were kind of at a breach and you could have stolen his heart quite easily, but instead you turned his heart toward me. And I never forgot that. I thought, that's the goal of youth pastors. We think it's, you know, clamoring, getting a big crowd and, and getting everybody to follow the Pied Piper and that wasn't the case. And I think Andrew's done an excellent job with that at Shepherd Gate is to unite families, unite hearts of their youth, the, the teens with their, with their parents. It's been good. Well, you look through the scriptures of fathers and sons and how they responded, how they reacted to one another. And I, I always think about Enoch. Enoch they said he, he didn't there's no record of him dying. He just kind of goes to be with the Lord. He's a good man, righteous man. And who was his son? Enoch's son was Methuselah. And what was the key about Methuselah? He was the oldest person that ever lived, 969 years. What was the key to his success? Having a righteous father gave blessing to the next generation. You fathers, you mothers, being a, of, a, of a righteous persuasion, being, you know, engaged in Christ, that's the greatest blessing you can give your kids. It's better than any inheritance that you leave them. You can leave them millions of dollars and they can blow it in a minute and probably destroy themselves. But you give them this the righteousness of Christ, you've enriched their life far greater than any other uh, inheritance you can leave them. And, you know, we look through other scriptures. You try to see what the relationship was with Saul and Jonathan and his son and David and Solomon who took over the throne for him and then Solomon and Rehoboam. And what happened in all those relationships? And what was the investment that these men put in their sons and and how did they raise them up and, and what happened as a result? When we, we look at the, the children of Israel, and part of this verse is related to this, when you're turning the hearts of the children to the fathers, one of the things that was important to Israel was they maintained the unity of their faith. And Israel, the faith was to believe in God and to cherish His Word and to keep that going from generation to generation and keep telling the stories and the testimonies to your children and to your children's children.
But all of a sudden, they were in a position where they were being influenced by other nations. And instead of wanting to draw their hearts back to God, the next generation was going astray. It's like the, the virtues of the scriptures, the virtues of the Bible, were not being honored and cherished by the next generation. They were making up their own virtues and what they considered to be virtuous in this world. It, it reminds me of today. Instead of following the, the, a, a biblical worldview, let's say, that people are going off and, and finding other things. That, oh, this is more virtuous here in their mind. It's not turning the other cheek. It's knocking the, your enemy out before they have a chance to get you. You know, preeminent strike. It, it's a strange day in which we're living and the things that God said were, were right and holy and good, now people are turning it upside down and making it just the opposite. It's a difficult time for us. In 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the 15th verse, it, it, it has this to say about fathers and, and it says, though, though you have countless guides in Christ, you have not many fathers. And then he goes on and explains to them how Paul was a father to them. We're talking about spiritual fathers. So many men have put their investing their lives in their careers and in their provision for their family, but they didn't invest time in their family. I think one of the improvements we've seen from when we were raised, say in the 50s to today, is that fathers are taking more time with their families, being more involved. Some of that has to do because in our day, mom stayed home, and nowadays you may have both parents working, and so father shares in some of the responsibilities in taking care of the kids, even maybe doing dishes or vacuuming or something weird like that. But uh, I say that because I'm an old timer and I don't vacuum, except I've been vacuuming termites for the last few days, but I typically don't vacuum. But uh, let little lady do that. So it's needing to be and have spiritual fathers, guys who invest their life in Christ so that they can be that guide, that mentor for others, not just their own natural children, but even beyond that. We've had many examples over the years of that. When they asked Candace Owen if you know who she is, she was on Capitol Hill, she's been in an outspoken person regarding the, the black community. She is a, a, a woman of color, and she said that the number one problem in the black community in the inner city today is the absence of fathers. It's not needing more welfare, needing all these things the government wants to provide. She says, what we need is our fathers. We've lost those mentors. I've told you that illustration before about how they the, uh, they had too many elephants in the jungle and they wisely thought, well, what we'll do, we'll take out all the old bulls from the elephants and uh, that will reduce the population. Everything will be fine. They took out all the old bulls from the jungle and the next thing that happened was the young bulls, the teenage bulls, if you will, they started tearing up the jungle. They didn't have respect for the jungle. They started killing the rhinoceroses, which is... They, something that they don't usually do. They were little terrorists. And they went, what are we going to do to fix this? We've created this terrible situation. How do we fix it? And somebody said, just bring back one of the old bulls. They brought back an old bull, and guess what happened? Everything was right in the jungle again. They respected the rhinoceros. They respected the jungle. They didn't just tear it up. I think that's when we're raising our, our horses, we like to raise our foals with a stallion. They have a better personality when there's a stallion there. You think, oh, we're so different. We're so much higher than, than the animal world. <laughs> we, how could you possibly relate this? Well, it tends that the mares, the mothers, let the babies, the foals, get away with stuff. Dads don't let them get away with it. They've become the enforcers. 
And the babies have better respect and personalities when they're raised with the fathers. It's an interesting observation. It's the same kind of thing that they found out in the jungle. When I was this week, uh, just a, a quick story. I had to go to Pennsylvania and I was having a modification done to a tractor, picking up another implement for it. And so I had to leave at like four in the morning on Thursday morning and drive tractor and trailer and truck to Pennsylvania. And, and this is up above Lancaster, so it's about almost three hour drive. And so I'm making this trip and I'm praying the whole way. I, I really didn't turn the radio on. I just pray the way up there and pray for you all, pray for what God wants to do in our, in our body and in our church, our world. And so I'm praying my way up there and I, I get up there and they do the work and I'm tootling around the area, beautiful little area. I like the people a lot and the things up in that area. Even call it Mount Joy, Pennsylvania. So you know it had to be nice. It, it was joyful. And then I pack up and I'm on my way back home and I'm praying again uh, about safety. I, Lord, don't let anybody get hurt and I've got all this equipment and stuff. Keep me safe on the road and make sure I don't hurt anybody else. You don't want anything to fall off your tractor, your trailer, your truck. Don't want anybody to get hurt. And I'm praying this and when I'm praying it, I'm praying this verse. From Colossians 1, 17, it says, He is before all things. This is Jesus. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And I'm praying, I'm saying, now, Jesus, you hold all things together. You hold my tractor together. You hold the trailer together. You hold the truck together. You keep it all together. Lord, you just keep it all together. I'm just trusting you to keep it all together. And I got to Gettysburg, and all of a sudden, it felt like I hit something. I thought, what did I run over? I, there was nothing on the road. I didn't see anything. And I pulled off on the ramp, and I looked under. I didn't see anything. I turned, drove down to where there was a gas station. I crawled underneath, and all of a sudden, an inside tire on my dually truck had separated and had come apart. You know, it's separated. It's not totally flat, but all the rubber's falling off of it. And it's about 5.30, and I'm looking up. I'm saying, is there a road service around here? What can I find? Was it a tire dealer or whatnot? He didn't find anything the first three calls. The next call, I said, try calling this place. And I called them. They were eight miles away, but I said, I can, I can get there, but I, if I can go slow. I happened to be on the very road they were on. And so I just traveled eight miles. They were going to stay open for me after hours and help me out. And I thought, what a blessing you guys are. I get there, and it's not like a little tire shop like around here or Midas. They hit, it's ready for semi-trucks. It's like this building, and you could drive a truck from one end right on through to the other end. And I just pulled in there. I didn't have to unhook the trailer. I didn't have to unhook the tractor, nothing. I just got in. They jacked me up and said, oh, your inside tire, it's all shot. This tire actually doesn't look too good either. This one's, you know, it's up to you. Which one? I said, replace all four of them. I replaced the front ones, just replace all four of them. They put them on them, and I got back on the road rejoicing. I said, you guys don't know how, what a great blessing you are. Down the road I go. God is always watching out for us, always making provision. Blessings are awaiting us. Even when it looks like it's a disaster, it's a blessing. God turns it into a blessing. And he did that for me just this week. And I experienced that. And I always think, God, thank you that you watch out for us and that you're providing these blessings along the way. Keep us together, God. Keep my truck together, my tractor together, my trailer together. Keep it together. But God, more so than that, keep together our families, our husbands and wives. Keep together our children. Let's don't get separated. Don't get off in the, in somewhere else. You know, we, we want to keep it together, Lord. Keep our, our uh, biblical virtues and the values that we have. Keep that culture among us, Lord. Don't let that leave us. Because if you don't, then this is what the Malachi said, Malachi 4, 6, it says, otherwise I will visit the earth with a curse. And the word for that curse is a little different than just you know, having a spell over you. It means utter destruction. This is what happens. Can happen to families, utter destruction of a family. Can happen to communities, utter destructions of communities. All this can happen and it's when we stop paying attention to the things that are important. 
Scott's going to play a little clip here for us. This is a song that was written in 1974. Some of you will remember it. It was a number one song. It has a powerful message uh, about keeping your priorities in order. While I was away And he was talking for I knew it And as he grew He'd say I'm gonna be like you Dad You know I'm gonna be like you And the cat's in the cradle And the silver spoon Little boy blue And the man on the moon When you're coming home Dad I don't know when But we'll get together then You know we'll have a good time then My son turned ten just the other day He said, thanks for the ball, Dad, come on, let's play Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today, I got a lot to do He said, that's okay, and then he walked away But his smile never did and said, I'm gonna be like him Yeah, you know I'm gonna be like him And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon Little boy blue and the man on the moon When you come in I don't know when but we'll get together then You know we'll have a good time then Well, he came from college just the other day So much like a man I just had to say Son, I'm proud of you Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile What I'd really like, Dad the bar of the car keys See you later, can I have them please? And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon Little boy blue and the man on the moon When you're coming home, son, I don't know when But we'll get together then Dad, you know we'll have a good time then Since retired, my son's moved away I called him up just the other day I said I'd like to see you if you don't mind He said I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids are the flu But it's your nice talking to you, Dad It's been your nice talking to you And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me He'd grown up just like me My boy was just like me And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon Little boy blue and the man on the moon When you're coming home, son, I don't know when But we'll get together then, then We're gonna have a good time And I saw her. No time for monkeys. It was, uh, that's pretty poignant because it tells us that even though we're busy about our things, if we don't take priority and give it the time to our children that it is necessary, is needed, then they follow the same patterns that we did. Follow after that. We don't, we don't want that. So back to what happened with my dad. I I, I just wanted my dad to know the love of Jesus. And when he would say things to me in ridicule and whatnot, I mean, it was, it was I was thinking, you know, when I, high school football, I, I'm awarded all Northern Virginia football player. And you know what my dad's comment was? Well, I thought you'd be all state. And I didn't know, is that a compliment or is that a criticism? I wasn't sure because that's the way things were. And so we didn't talk, but Jesus came in, changed my life, 
And now I wanted Jesus to change my dad's life. And so we spent a lot of time together, and there would be days where it was hard. I'd, I was biting my tongue because he would tell me something. He says, you call yourself a Christian, and why don't you cut your hair? And I just try and love him back. No, I'm not going to retaliate, not going to say anything. I'm just going to love him back. That happened for about six months, and when I wouldn't fight back, he quit. And then at 12 months later, he was sharing my testimony with others. Then we started spending a lot of time together. We joined our, in similar projects. I'd take on interests that he had just to spend time with him. And we went from adversity, really not even speaking to each other, to becoming best friends. So I went through marriage, children. Dad lived in 97. We got to be best friends all those years. My older two sisters would comment and at times they'd say, you know what, Dad is really mellowing in his old age. <laughs> I said, that's usually not how it happens. A lot of times people get more cranky in his old age. But Jesus is working in his heart. One person, this is what I came to the conclusion years ago, one person can change the course of an entire family. Don't let, and here, here's the, the other caution that I learned, don't let somebody become your negative standard. My sister said, I'll never raise my kids like our parents raised us. And then later she said, I don't know why, but I raised my kids just like our parents raised us. And I said, because you had the wrong standard. Even if it's a negative standard, that's your standard. And you'll end up repeating it. I got a new standard. You know who my new standard was? It was Jesus. That was my standard. When I say that it's so important for us as a, as a church, churches are getting smaller. Our church is getting a little bit smaller. Getting smaller. You see, maybe we should change some things, be, be more worldly, if you will. Take a different standard, take the world standard and bring it to the church, which is what's happening to a lot of churches right now. And I say, then there's no standard for people to come to. There's nothing to look to. You want to be a good example. You want to be a good witness. You want to be a standard bearer. You do that as a family. You do that as a church. You do it within your community. Raise up godly standards and, and witnesses. John 10.10. 10. Well, first I'd say Matthew 12.25. Jesus said this. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. It doesn't matter whether you're a family or a kingdom. If you're divided against yourself, you will crumble. But we have these other promises that when we're standing together and united, we can do great things. This is what the, the other part of the Malachi lesson is, is that if, if, you're, if you don't come together, then destruction is coming. But if you do come together, powerful things you can do together. In John 10.10 10, Jesus says there, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. We know what the enemy is trying to do. He tries to divide people. He tries to destroy them, ruin them. But God's intention is to bring us together that we can do great and mighty things for he and his kingdom. So we should all be working for God's restoration and looking to see families connected. We have some prodigals among our church. It says some of the children of our, of our families are separated from their families. It grieves my heart. I pray for them all the time. Because I know that's hard on the parents. It's got to be hard on the kids too to see them come together and see what God brings 
as a result of their being united together. So we avoid the, the curse, but we also bring incredible blessings, opening the, the windows of heaven upon our families, upon our community, and upon our nation, and hopefully well beyond that to the world. As we glorify God, as we take his love, not only within our hearts, but apply it to those around us, starting with our families. In NIV, when it is said here, turn the hearts of the, family, of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, NIV uses the word parents. So you can use, uh, don't, don't think that this didn't in, involve mothers. There's plenty of mothers that are estranged from their kids as well. It just happened in my case. It was my father and I, button heads. Let's unite ourselves together in purpose. That's the whole point is to draw our hearts to God, bring forth repentance, and repentance that brings us together and united in the relationships that he's called us in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the instruction of your word and the standard that you've raised up, the warnings that you've given us, but also the opportunity for blessing, restoration, reconciliation among families and that uniting and that power that comes from that. But also we thank you that there is, is power when all of our institutions, our church, our community, our nation, when we tear down the walls of division and purpose to love one another and to join with one another in, in your purposes, God, that you can do such great and mighty things and pour out blessings upon us Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who holds all things together. We know that works from the, monot from the uh, tiniest of cells and molecular structures, but it, it's also true among relationships and families, even among nations. We, we pray, oh God, that you would hold our families together here at Shepherdgate. That you would unite our sons and daughters and with their, their parents and Lord, that this would be a powerful thing going forward, that great blessings will fall upon that family. And we just see how you have done that over and over again. And Father, that we would stand guard against the enemy who would come to divide us. Because knowing that he can divide us, he can pick us off. But Lord, when we stand together, that we stand united in you. And that there is great power in that. So Father, we pray for you to turn our hearts toward you. Give us compassion and understanding for one another. Lord, that you will unite us one with another, even as you prayed that we would be one, even as you and the Father are one. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you all would stand, let's worship the Lord. You came from heaven's throne, acquainted with our sorrow, to trade the debt we owe, your suffering for our freedom. The Lamb of God in my place, your blood poured out, my sin erased, it was my death, you died, I am raised to life, hallelujah, the Lamb of God. My name upon your heart. Thank you, Father. My shame upon your shoulder. The power of sin undone. The cross for my salvation.
There is no greater love. The Savior lifts it up. There is no greater love. Sing that again. for the lamb that unites us, Lord God, to the Father. Father, unite our hearts to you. And God, I pray that as we unite with you, God, that you would heal our relationships. Lord God, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.